This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour. I'm Malcolm White. I'm your host today. And man, am I excited about my guest. Today in the studio, actually, we're remote. We're in the office at historic Hall and Mal's downtown historic. Jackson, <laughs> 200 South Commerce Street. But my guests today are Robert St. John and Anthony Thaxton, both producers and filmmakers uh, of a gigantic new project, uh, both a documentary film and a book about the life of the great Walter Anderson, the extraordinary life and art of the Islander. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to be here. Good to be here. So tell us how this idea came to be. Talk a little bit about the origin and uh, the process of, of creating a new documentary about someone that we're all familiar with, but really taking a deeper dive. Yeah, so, so as I remember it, and thanks for having me, I love the, the Howl and Mouse office. Of this is, <laughs> and you are right, this is an historic place. And, and we strategically planned it where we would <laughs> be here right at lunchtime. So go ahead. <laughs> we, um, as, as I remember it, um, Wyatt and I were doing uh, our magical Mississippi tour where we're hauling people all around the state. We were filming our TV show, Palette to Palette, uh, of which Anthony, uh, here to my right, uh, who Anthony and I have worked together probably 20 or more years, but Anthony was the producer, director, editor of that television show. We covered the entire state, and we were hitting museums and and all sorts of places, restaurants. And we ended up on the last night at the Walter Anderson Museum uh, with our group. And we were in the little room, and, and I'm sure everybody we're talking to knows about the little room. But the, for that one person that doesn't, um, <clears throat> uh, Walter Anderson kind of lived a life of a loner on their family compound and, and lived alone in, in his cottage uh, that the family never went in. And after he passed away... Um, the family went into this room that he had painted murals all over the floor and ceiling. And uh, it was a very emotional thing for the family. And they, then they found all of this art that they didn't know existed. Right. So we were in the little room with our group. And John Anderson, uh, the youngest son of Walter Anderson, had just shown up that night. And, and he was talking about when his mom went in that room. Uh, Anthony was there filming. Uh, I was in the room. I'm not sure. I think Wyatt was painting somewhere. And and something clicked. And I remember if it was Anthony's idea or it was my idea, it doesn't matter. Who, whoever's idea it was, we thought, you know, this – I think it was in that moment. Mm-hmm. It, it was. I was touched. I was emotionally moved hearing John talk about that. And I can remember him saying, and I think this is in the documentary, that, you know, his mom used to say, your dad uh, would have been a great artist – uh, had he not been such a beachcomber. And then after he passed away, they go in there, they find these 2,000 or more uh, works of art, these amazing watercolors. And she said, your father was such a good artist because he was a beachcomber. <laughs> and it was right. in that moment, I think, and Anthony and I started yep. talking about it. Yep. And really, <laughs> uh, that's really the most talking I need to do in this interview because Anthony kind of took the ball and ran with this thing. Well, no, and for the, for the last three years, has really, um, as far as the documentary and the book, has 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 done all the heavy lifting on this thing, and it, it it's something that I am so proud uh, to have been a, a small part of. But Anthony's really uh, has has done an awesome job on this. Is that how is that how you absolutely, remember it? Absolutely, absolutely. And we were all moved that night, and. And it was tight quarters in there, and it was just so unexpected. We we were at the very end of our Magical Mississippi tour that we were doing for Palette to Palette. Right. And, uh, Malcolm, you helped us kick off that season, oh, you know, right. on a good episode. Right. and. Uh, so all things Mississippi here and, uh, and, and, and we were tired and we go in this little room and then John starts talking and we, we, I had never, I had met him years and years ago before that, but didn't get a long time to talk. So it really was something that, uh, it just spoke to us and you and I had been wanting to do 
things uh, with pallet to pallet where we were always running Wyatt's painting and he would sit still, but most of the group, all the stuff were running across Italy. We're running across Mississippi. <laughs> so we never had time to set up lights and tripods. We wanted to do something where we could set up and do something a, a, a little more serious and intelligent yeah. and cultural, you know, I mean, we wanted to do something um, relevant and, and Anderson, I grew up on the coast uh, and worked on shrimp boats. And uh, so here was this artist painting crabs and fish and shrimp. And so it spoke to, I would take the Horn Island logs out on the shrimp boat with me and, uh, and pour through those color pages in the middle, uh, never knowing that we would then be writing our own book on Anderson years uh, later and including 276 pages of art, not just a couple of pages in the middle, you know, but just some beautiful stuff. So it, it really was just from that meager beginning and the fa we met with the family. They loved the idea and um, there we go. You know, that's, speaking of meeting with the family, the the beauty of this project, Malcolm, you and I were talking about this before the thing, is, is we got total access to all four family members. This is the, the most thorough telling of the Walter Anderson story and the most comprehensive representation of his work, I think that's ever been done. How many books are there, Anthony? Like twenty two or more. Gosh, there are a ton of books. There are a yeah. lot of books, and and I'm not just and saying some very this, good ones. But yeah, but we knew going in, we wanted this because I mean we had total access to the vault, total access to the museum. The museum people were great, um, and and so. We included a lot of art that had not been seen before, yeah, and that was right. important yeah, that was, in the documentary and in the book. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, f for our listeners, um, <clears throat> the documentary has premiered on MPB already. That's right. That was a couple of weeks ago. Right. But one can go to MPB's website and and see Correct. the documentary. Yeah. Uh, as I did <clears throat> last night, and it's just beautiful. Uh, the, the, the the artwork, the stories, the storytelling, the people you picked, it is just a moving and remarkable piece of art. And, you know, Anthony, I know this is sort of what you do, but Robert, you step outside of your usual restaurateur, chef, uh, radio personality, uh, travel uh, uh, guru into a brand new field and produced, uh, a, a, you became a filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I guess uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take that title a little reluctantly, but, but uh, as a producer, you know, I, I, I produced the, our TV show Palette to Palette, and so really I was... I was a, uh, a small component in this uh, thing. A Anthony has had the the vision on this thing from the start, and his and really, I was a sounding board a lot of the time, and and I think I made maybe a few suggestions here and there. But Anthony is really um, well. Robert's selling himself short. Hey, you, you know how any collaboration goes. Um, you've got certain aspects, and there were certain things Robert was very passionate about and wanted to include, and things I was passionate about. Um, and it's hard to fit this life into an hour. There is so Correct. much you couldn't, you can't make up this life that that this family has lived. Uh, but Robert, uh, Robert was so good with 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 ideas and and coming up with. Uh, he has really good storytelling instincts. So uh, it it has been a lot of fun, and and we both have different connections. We both have different skill sets and playing off of each other. And not, and not only that, uh, John Gibson at Mississippi public broadcasting gave us some good insight. My wife, uh, who kind of served as a, an assistant kind of producing role there with me on my end, uh, really did a lot of research, a lot of, so it, it's been a, a real yeah. family oriented kind of thing. I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. It's something I'm, I'm I am really proud of. Uh, haven't been a, a part of this thing and i you know i guess in the collaboration part which i love i love working with other people whether i'm opening a restaurant whether i'm doing a book a tv show or anything the collaborative process and that creative synergy that gets going is is really really but it's no fun for me just to do something on my own i mean it's really it yeah, yeah. and so to the to the extent maybe i was a sounding board or made some suggestions here and there it's it's been a blast but i, I am so proud of this book when, when people see this book Bo the it's book gonna, is is beautiful yeah, it, it, it is just so beautiful in the documentary i think uh by probably next fall you're going to see it on a lot of pbs stations across the country and that's one thing 
that I kind of tried to hammer through this whole thing. And we let yeah. the family know that we want people in Oregon in Portland, Oregon and Portland, Maine right. to know who, who don't know who Walter Anderson was and they don't know the work and they don't know the story. We want this to be the telling of that. And for that, I th for no other reason than that uh, being important for Mississippi, uh, you know, I'm I'm glad that I was a part of something that's going to spread the word on his talent. Was the uh, concept of the documentary and the book part of the original idea, or did was it originally about a film and later a book came out? Actually, that's exactly how it happened. We we were my first cut of the film. Robert and I were laughing. Our first cut was like two hours long at least, and we hadn't even put in everything that it we wanted. It was going to be a three-part I mean, it was, time. yeah, uh -huh. we, we had we had a lot of ideas, <laughs> but for it to be really viable for nationwide distribution, like we're hoping, um, it, it has to be 56-46. So, oh, so we had to really, really trim down and condense, and I think that, that aided in our storytelling. Yeah. We decided along the way, we wrestled with whether or not to have a narrator, but we wound up not having a narrator. The stories just flowed together, and we were able to edit that and craft it without having that intrusive narrative voice. I will say, if Morgan Freeman is listening, we will recut uh, the documentary if he we'll wants do the to director's cut exactly. to, to narrate. Morgan, just please I, give us a call. I would say this, though, uh, you know, using John. Uh, John Maxwell, Maxwell yeah. as the voice of Walter Anderson. That was pretty was, cool. Was brilliant. It? That that was a nice piece. Um, so, so you did in, 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 in one way have, have the voice of Walter. Anderson. We did. And I think we wound up having, yeah. having, uh, the best voice we could for that, for that part. And he, he came in and he, he read cold. Uh, he, he came in and, and just nailed it right off the bat. Robert had some astute, obs some, uh, suggestions on how to record and the kind of the tone we needed to go at. And it, it really worked well. Uh, but we had so many things, um, so many things, um, that we wanted to use in the film to your earlier question that we did wind up going and saying to the family, we'd love to do a book because there, there are so many great images that haven't been seen. Some of the images in the book were actually lost in Katrina. So right. we're, we're publishing some paintings that haven't been seen, but no longer exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's an important piece. And I, I know a lot of art books will have a lot of white space. I mean, we really tried to incorporate a lot yeah, of this, art. This into book it. is loaded up. It's a it lot is. of information. It's just a lot of art. It's, yeah. it's like a museum in a box. <laughs> there you go. Hey, that's a good point. One thing about Maxwell um, and 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 what Anthony's talking about, you know, to, to, to deliver that, you know, Anderson, I think his voice uh, talking to the family was, was a little higher pitched and he probably had a little New Orleans accent since he grew there. But we wanted just... I think I told Anthony, just Nebraska, just no, no, no affect to that or whatever. But the thing, if you haven't seen the documentary yet, when, when you first, there's a little front matter Anthony put in there, but, but the first time John Maxwell comes on and reads that Anderson quote still, and I've seen this thing a few dozen or more times, it still moves me, right. but he, he nailed it. Jill Connor Brown did the family. I mean, the Mary family has such great. a great yeah. delivery and they're all good storytellers. Yeah. Mary's a fabulous storyteller. Yeah. And, and a little more on John Maxwell for our listeners. Of course, you know, John Maxwell's a great writer, actor, old Mr. Faulkner, uh, was his one man play. And he used to have a studio here in this building. John worked really? and wrote upstairs for many, many years. Uh, uh, along with other artists, uh, who, he's a who, treasure who resided here. But yeah, he's also a recipient of the Mississippi Arts Commission's Governor's Award, Arts Award, uh, and a great, great voice. Amazing indeed. So we're talking to Robert St. John and Anthony Thaxton about their new project, which is Walter Anderson: The Extraordinary Life and Art of the Islander. It is both a documentary film and a book. <laughs> Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app.
Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour. Malcolm White, I am delighted to be the host today for our show. Hope you're having a wonderful Sunday afternoon out there in the great state of Mississippi. Two guests today, Robert St. John and Anthony Thaxton, great Mississippians, uh, have put in a lot of work and have gotten a lot of great results. They have a new project. It is Walter Anderson, The Extraordinary Life and Art of the Islander. And it is both a documentary film project and a book. Welcome back, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. Good to be back. You know, Anthony, in the first segment, we mentioned family a number of times, really without being specific. We talked about the Anderson family. We talked about your family. Your, you, you mentioned that your wife was involved in helping produce. But it's greater than that for you. It is truly a family film and a family project, sir. It, it, it is, and they're great. My son composed the music for the film, um, and he uh, he was, uh, I think, a sophomore at Mississippi College at the time and when he started this, and he composed uh, 10 or 12 pieces of, of music for the film, and then he, at the time, the students that he recruited to play the instruments, the flute player, the celloist, and the uh, pianist, uh, were all uh, seniors at Jackson Academy at the time, so these are high school kids playing these instruments, and then he recorded uh, recruited about a year later as we were doing the percussion um, two students from Mississippi College so um, the music the, the story of the music is really a fun part of the documentary um, but not only that even if you know nothing about the story of the music the music is just really it fits the film so well and it just helps tell that story musically it's just so so well done um, my daughter, Sydney, uh, is a student at Jackson Academy, and she helped film some of the, uh, the, the drone footage. Uh, she helped film uh, some of the, uh, the shots across the artwork. You know, we tried to do that a little more cinematically. Um, so we were putting images on the floor and panning across right. out on Horn Island. We did a trip, and we're panning across on the... And we threw a, a print of an image into the fire to burn it up. You I know. saw that. So, I, I wondered who actually <laughs> painted that print. There's an audible gasp whenever you see a screen. It, it's a, of the it's film. a faux Anderson. Yeah. Who Every, did it? Everybody goes, oh, it's just a print of one of his, but everybody just got an intake of breath. Of, um, and I have, um, I had a, uh, a student from Taiwan in my watercolor class at MC, and she said, you did not burn that painting, did you? And uh, no, no, Joyce, I did not. But uh, but so it was. It was a very much of a family, and this is a story of of a father and and his his told basically by his family members, his mm -hmm. his children and his wife Sissy. We found an interview at the Department of Archives and History of Sissy from 1979, and had some great audio clips from her in there. There was also some audio from Peter, his brother, right? Yes. and that I, I was shocked to see, uh, to hear the Peter. In video. Yes. Yes, um, in the old video. That was, is that 16 millimeter? Yeah, I, I think that it was, and it was um, Dr. Billy Lytle from Mississippi College. Uh, for, for, uh, he passed away a few years ago. I mean, but for years and years, he headed up the communications department, and they did a film in 1978, a year after The Islander, so I think there was a lot of interest about the the Andersons and Shearwater Pottery. He did a video of a film on uh, Shearwater Pottery. So we we found that in the Mississippi College uh, Library, and what a great find that was! With yeah. and I remember playing that for John, and he just had tears running down. He said, "How great to hear those voices again!" Uh, and the voice of Mary. I mean, we we found so many neat things in the in the in the research over this time. I want to backtrack a little bit and talk about the score of this thing because I, I think the more cynical listener is going to think, well, the director brought his kids, exactly, in or whatever. And I'm, I almost hate that people know that because when you watch this documentary, if you haven't watched it yet or if you've seen it, the the music is spot on. It is beautiful. Uh, the, and to think it came from a 19 year old, I'm not sure, young man. You know, it is it is amazing. It is beautiful. This uh, Bryant's got a great future. But on top of that, uh, uh, Anthony failed to mention uh, his wife, uh, who's an educator, 
uh, wrote a, a full curricula for Mississippi school children, uh, grade by grade, to where when they watch this documentary in the classroom, there's a curriculum that follows that that uh, they can do to kind of do a deeper dive and get them engaged to study more. So when when you say it's a family prayer, it was all four of the family, mm-hmm. and but but the music. I, I tell Anthony when we're before people watch, I said, don't tell me it was your son. Wait till <laughs> afterwards because they're going to get in their mind, well, it's not going to. But then when you hear it, it is yeah. so good. It is very good. Yeah, no question. It's it's extraordinarily well done. And I did not know that your children were involved when I watched the documentary. And, uh, you know, I, I could have easily been convinced you used composers from New York or, or the West Coast. That's Who right. knew? Yeah, pre-recorded and, and like music I, from some symphony. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bits and pieces of music. The fact that it's an original score, you know, is news to me, and and I watched the whole documentary without having. Oh, that's any great! Info. I remember the segue to the uh, to the Asian piece where he goes to China and 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 thinking, oh, the music just changed, uh, you know, from an American sounding. Right. Went to the Black Keys up there. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting yeah. uh, segue back and forth. Right. You know, you're you're leaving uh, Ocean Springs and you're going to China. And we'll be right back. You know that kind exactly, of thing. exactly. And and that's Bryant's uh, girlfriend Fumi, who's playing the flute on that. Uh, so so it, it it and that's what I love. Mississippi. That, made. That's what I love about Mississippi is that uh, we're, we're not intimidated by. Uh, you use good people, and and if they, like Robert's wife Jill coming in and watching different cuts of the film, and and you know Jill's real shy about her opinions, oh, you know. Always. So she'll, but yeah. she, so everybody that would participate and watch had had neat things to say, and there were some things that Robert said. Uh, hey, you need to change this, and I didn't wind up changing. But there are some things that I didn't want to take out, and and everybody's like, "No, you got to take that out during the dolphin part." And all. you know, so uh-huh. there, uh, it's a give and take kind of thing. But what has been so cool for so many years, I've done so many things like a one man band kind of thing, and having to because we load up on a plane and go shoot in Italy, and we're just on on the go. You can't take a, a big crew with you. Uh, but this has been a lot of fun with getting more and more people involved and um, and getting to know John Maxwell and and Jill Connor Brown better. And we had originally recorded Jill as the voice of Sissy, uh-huh. reading uh, clips, uh, reading comments from approaching the Magic Hour. Walter's wife. Right. Walter's wife. And I spent a, a day or two recording all of this voiceover with her, and it was wonderful. And then we found the archival interview recording of Sissy. And I'm like, Jill, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> you're uh, out. <laughs> you're not going to believe this. I said, but I do have some stories that I want told in there. And, and she did a great job. And uh-huh. I was, uh, and she's a Mississippi treasure too. But uh, Dunlap, Bill Dunlap did a great job in the film. Um, now in the book, what we did was for the main body of text in the book, it's mostly excerpts from these interviews that we did not use in the film because we had so many great stories and observations and funny things and sad things and uh, regrets and all of these kind of things. We said we can put those in a book as the text instead of Robert and me pontificating about Anderson or here's one more art critic saying more. It's the family telling stories. So if you like the film, you like the documentary and you like the personal intimacy of the film – you're going to love this book because the book really goes even further and you're able to get a cup of coffee and open up anywhere in the book. It's kind of chronological, but you can open up anywhere. And here I'm going to look at the Shearwater section while I'm having my coffee this morning. And you're reading these things that relate to the Shearwater section. So quotes from the family. Quick sissy story, uh, wife of Walter Anderson. I was fortunate enough uh, in my life to have met her many times because she used to run uh, the, the little shop. Uh, the gift shop uh, on Shearwater property. So whenever I would go, I would always go by the shop. And a lot of times she was there uh, minding the store. But one time Sissy came here to Hallam House to eat with Mary and other friends of hers. She was in town, I think, promoting uh, the Magic Hour and was, was in Jackson. So they came here to eat. And on our menu, we have my Aunt Murtis's gumbo. And I had written a short narrative about the gumbo that said that it was a recipe that my aunt uh, uh, came up with spending time at Mary Walker Bio. Right. Now, Robert knows exactly a little bit about Mary that. Walker, yeah. 
And, and then I said, near the hamlet of Van Cleve. So I'm called over to the table, and Sissy Anderson says, Oh, Malcolm, you know, it was so good to see you. We're glad to be here. She said, I was just reading your menu about your aunt's gumbo. She said, I have one correction. She said, the hamlet that is closest to Mary Walker Bio is Goche, yeah, that's right. my hometown. <laughs> So I went to the printer the next day and had a whole new version of the oh, menus printed and changed <laughs> yeah. it to Goche. Yeah. Tusi's Fish Camp. There right you go. There, Mary Walker Bayou, Mary Walker Marina, the Tiki Room. And you, yeah. you spent some time there. Yeah, and that's where Oldfields is yeah. actually. Right. That's, yeah, that was my connection. I wrote that. I, I did the afterward in the book, and you know, I wrote about you know growing up. I'm from Hattiesburg, obviously, but. Um, we spent time after after my dad died. My mom bought a fish camp because uh, she knew she couldn't play football, she couldn't hunt. She figured she'd learn how to fish, and she's an artist. Her mom was an artist. Her mom was an artist, and so you know we always got, uh, as I saw it, drugged to any you know gallery or showing or arts festival or anything, and that's how I ended up as a kid uh, when we were on up the Pascagoula River there right. where our fish camp was. Uh, ended up at Shearwater Pottery, and uh, was when I first really could probably maybe the first artist I ever really connected with, and and thought I, I get this stuff because there were crabs and shrimp and right and all of that seafood and, and but y'all had a big alligator block print. She got one of the uh, alligator block prints that hung in our den as a kid. A I dollar actually, a foot. I have it. I have it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and she bought that when we were there at Shearwater uh, when I was probably ten or eleven and hmm. and so yeah I, I became and that's in the book with your afterward oh that's right that's right yeah. yeah so we've talked a lot about the film the documentary film part of the project but just uh, regarding the book I understand that you guys are caught up in in the ch- supply chain snafu yeah, yeah we'll unload those uh, <laughs> right after Thanksgiving and then we will hit the road. And we've got a lot of signings uh, booked, and um, and on you know. Facebook and online, we we've posted what uh, I think we have fifteen signings in twenty days. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah, welcome to that world. Yeah. Well, I was in Lemuria the other day and talking to John Evans, uh, and I asked about this book, and he was explaining to me that he has one copy, <laughs> and he has it on display, and he's taking advanced orders for when they arrive. That's yeah. great. <laughs> John's yeah. such a good guy. Yeah, we're going to, that actually, and Anthony and I were talking about this a few weeks ago, the very first book I ever did was a collaboration with Wyatt called Southern Palette, and it had, I think it was a dock strike out in San Diego or something, (laughs) and the book arrived the first day of signings, and and we hit the road, so I think Anthony and I are going to kind of be doing the same thing, that book's going to hit the ground, and then we're going to hit the road. Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. We are a Yucca Drive-In Theater. We're the last operating drive-in in the state of Mississippi. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Freaked me out that you could come and drive your car and park and watch the movie outside. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app, Mile Marker, a Mississippi Roads podcast. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour. Malcolm White, I'm your host today. So happy to be uh, in the office at Howl and Mouse with uh, two of my great friends and really creative Mississippians, Robert St. John and Anthony Thaxton. Welcome back, guys. Thank you. We feel at home in this creative office. Here. Well, that's a restaurant. I, I've been, yeah, I feel very, very at home. So the new project, Walter Anderson, The Extraordinary Life and Art of the Islander, is out both as a documentary film uh, and as a book. And Anthony, you're a, you're a visual artist. You're a painter. 
what sort of uh, influence or impact has Walter Anderson uh, had in oh, wow. in your work or or, I or think not? No, he ab- absolutely has. Again, someone look someone to look to growing up, saying it's okay to paint crabs and uh, and see importance in those things around you all all the time. Um, because I, I grew up in a, a house. Uh, my dad was a high school football coach, you know. So I, I <laughs> and we know about that. <laughs> and working on shrimp boat. Your 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 dad had been a coach and and Dunlap's dad and Wyatt's dad. You know. Yeah, we, we, we were we were coaching thirty miles north of you uh, <laughs> when I was growing up at so, Perkinston Junior. So College. it's interesting that all of us g- turned into a creative life of sorts. And and um, um, Dunlap one time I was talking to him about that, and he said uh, we need to form a club. How I grew up in Mississippi with a coach for a father and still became an artist, you know? <laughs> and I think maybe because we because he was an artist, uh, a f- coach. But uh, yeah, we um, he his art really really spoke to me. Uh, then when I went to Mississippi College, Sam Gore and um, uh, Bob Dunaway and Kenneth Quinn, they all uh, in their own ways kind of would somehow touch on Anderson at some point because of the kind of stuff that I was doing and where I was from. So we made little pilgrimages down to, uh, to see his grave and go to Shearwater. Um, and in, in Wyatt's class, uh, you know, I, I studied with him. And uh, so watercolor has always been near and dear. And uh, John Anderson asked me if I'd ever tried to paint anything like his daddy. And I said, well, no, not really. So I, I gave it an attempt and right. ordered some vintage typewriter paper on eBay, and 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 it was only then. And I've studied Anderson stuff, but only when I started trying to paint and realizing how small those details are on those sheets of eight and a half by eleven typing paper that he t- painted on, it really struck me more and more how talented he was and yeah. what a genius he really. That word's thrown around. Anderson was an absolute genius, and he. Uh, one of his quotes says, "A man that runs in one direction is easily caught, but if you run in three directions, you can't be caught." You know, you're. Um, and he ran in thirty different directions, and uh, I told the family the more and more I learned about Anderson. You know, they said, "Don't meet your heroes because you'll be disappointed." The more I got to know about Walter Anderson the more impressed I was, the more I came to love him. So that was kind of refreshing. Mm. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, just like I was talking about in songwriting, uh, how efficient Jason Isbell with lines. And I think Anderson was that way. He was very efficient with, with his with his lines, different kind of lines. And, um, you know, that's – I always say and, and have believed to my core that, that all great art has a sense of place. And I don't think there's ever been an artist who was more of his place mm-hmm. uh, than Walter Anderson. I'm so much so that he sacrificed, right. you know, in that place. But but I will also say, I know he's sitting next to me, but but Anthony and you you brought it up. I mean, he's he's not only a visual artist. I mean, he does sculpture. He's a videographer. He's an editor. He's a storyteller. He's a writer. He's a singer. He's a musician. I mean, he's a true Renaissance man. And, and this this project here, I think, is going to be a, a springboard for um, for a, a whole different kind of career uh, as we go forward. And I just, I mean, I I like riding on the, on the coattails and being being a part of this thing. It's fun. Surfs up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I always think of watercolorists as almost like fortune tellers because they're sitting there painting with something that's going to move, speaking yeah. of directions. And if you don't know where it's going, you're shot. And I've watched Wyatt Waters paint many, many times. And to sit there and to watch him predict where the red is going to run up against the blue and the orange, <laughs> right. I'm like, how do you control this? And he says to me sometimes, you don't really control it. <laughs> you just sort of go, put go it go out there. John Singer yeah. Sargent said, watercolor is making the best of an emergency. And and <laughs> yeah. I think that's a good quote. Robert, you're um, – you're also a renaissance man and you yes. you, you know you, you downplay your artistic side and that's fine but but anthony and i and everyone listening knows better you're a great writer uh you're a chef and if people don't believe that chefs are artists they they need to really examine that thinking <laughs> 
But, you know, most of your projects, if not all, uh, involve food and, and taste and recipes and ingredients. Here's a project uh, that doesn't have that, or did in some way did you see a, a sort of lens of, of food as culture here at all in this you know, project? Um, other than he painted a lot of seafood, which I'm a huge fan of. No, <laughs> not really. It was, you know, I think it was more, it was to, for me being a part of there was two things. One, again, I love the collaborative process and, and creating something with someone else and with, from an idea to, to, to an end result. Right. I, I enjoy that. And I really, really like that. But also, I mean, I just truly be, I love Mississippi. I mean, I love, you know, like how Texans supposedly have all this pride for that. Whatever that is, I have that for Mississippi. <laughs> I love this state. I love the people in this state. I'm mm-hmm. proud of of our, you know, our, our greatness in whether it's, you know, Walter Anderson or Muddy Waters, right. whoever it is. And so I wanted to be a part of something that helped get this story out to a new generation who maybe didn't see the Islander in 1978 because it hadn't run again. I think it's very important that we as Mississippians and Anthony and I have talked a lot and are kind of in the beginning stages of doing uh, this same thing with other notable Mississippians. And so that is something that really, really charges me and, and gives me, um, you know, I'd, I love the restaurant business. I'm always going to be in the restaurant business. Right. I'm never going to retire. I love doing it. I love creating that that aspect of it, too. But, you know, I love travel. I love uh, – and, and, and doing this, I think, is probably the most important thing hmm. I've ever done. I've, 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 I've never even thought about that till it just came out of my, my mouth. But, you know, <clears throat> I mean, serving people steak and hamburger and all that kind of thing, you know, we're feeding them. An extra table, I would say, is probably mm-hmm. the most important. But just to get outside of the state and and do something like this, you know, so that's that's why I like being well, a part of Take it. A, just a minute here and talk about extra. Just you, you mentioned extra yeah. table, and it's really important. So just oh, here we are yeah. at Thanksgiving, and let's yeah. talk about that work. So extra tables a nonprofit I started back in 2009, really with just a little idea to try to get some food to a, an agency in Hattiesburg. It has grown into uh, a situation to where we shipped our, our, our that first shipment we, we sent to Edward Street Fellowship Center in 2009 was probably a few hundred pounds, mm-hmm. try to help them. They were out of food. I was just trying to help. The idea came from that, and we have grown to now we are statewide. We're in over 55 uh, soup kitchens and food pantries in 2020. Uh, we shipped over 5 million pounds hmm. of healthy food. So it's just uh, there was a, there's a problem there that, I'd be honest with you, I was a little skeptical about early on. I, I didn't really think there was a hunger problem in Mississippi. I learned quickly there's a huge problem. We're a state of 2.9 million people. There are over 600,000. So 20% of the state suffers from what the government calls food insecurity. you got seniors, over 125,000 seniors. Who right now trying to figure out can they pay the light bill or can they go to the grocery store? You got over two hundred thousand school kids who eat a school breakfast, a school lunch, and don't eat again till the next day. Right. And so, I wanted to do something about that. An extra table. We have an executive director down there named Martha Allen, and she is a force of nature. Yes, she, she is, is. Uh, a large uh, reason this thing has grown. We've got a good board, and and we're we're fighting hunger and. Uh, Obesity, because we're we're number one in food insecurity, but we're also number one in obesity, and I had a problem with that. Yeah, people Reckon don't understand that. that yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Those two always go together. Always, because if you don't have enough money, you're living out of a convenience store. You're drinking the cheap sugar drinks mm-hmm. and snack foods, right. and so we ship only healthy food, healthy proteins, tuna, you know, low fat proteins, uh, you know, low sugar fruits, healthy grains, and things like so. ExtraTable.org, if I can get a plug. In, Absolutely, I was going to ask give. you. To. Uh, and it's fun because I got to do something with Extra Table. We just did a fundraiser kind of kind of thing where we painted helmets, tackle hunger, right. uh, you know, and with, again, my f- football father coach, you know, so I was like, sure, I'll paint a helmet. So I painted a Horn Island scene on mine. Very good. Um, you know, and inside I wrote, Walter Anderson had his nose broken twice playing football. So, see, there was a there was a Walter Anderson connection there somehow. <laughs> of course there was. <laughs> so, Robert, you mentioned sort of uh, off the cuff that – 
there will be other projects you think mm -hmm. you'd like to consider doing mm -hmm. of other famous Mississippians, and Lord knows there is a list as long yeah. as all of our arms yeah. put yeah. together. Anthony, any ideas on what the next project might we, be? We do, and and I because um, there are a lot of stories to tell. Um, I, you know, tell it, tell it. There may be an underwriter listening. There, there right may now. be. You know, one of the things um, when 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 I was a when I was a student at the math and science school was I was a senior and the the first because I was in the first class at MSMS and the first uh, year they had the first wealthy symposium at the M, at MUW. Mm -hmm. The second year I did a poster for the symposium and Miss Welty and I signed a limited edition of those. So not as, everybody has done that. So <laughs> as an so as as an eighteen year old I got to sign posters with Miss Welty and she. Uh, I remember her leaning in. She said, thank you for letting me sign your posters. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> really? Because I knew how m monumental that was at the time and, and what a thrill that was. And so Miss Welty has always had a, a place near and dear to me. We, we were camping with my family one time. My daughter was real young. And instead of telling a ghost story, I read Why I Live at the P.O. <laughs> and when I finished it, Good my choice. daughter looked up at me and she said, Daddy, read another one. And I'm like, yes, I, I just love Mississippi. So so Eudora Welty would be one that I would mm. love. I would I would love to help help tell her story and, and get that out there. Um there there are some William Faulkner projects going on, but uh, you know, we, we, we have a little angle on that that we we're uh talking with MPB about that we really like to do. So some of those biggies, but there are a lot of Mississippians. Marty Stewart and his Congress of Country Music and yeah. and Muddy Waters. Oh, there's so Shelby Foot. There there are so many good Mississippians. Willie the Hall and Mouse story, of course. Uh, you know there there are so many, yeah, and and I'm and I'm not even joking about that. There are so many good stories. Like so many people didn't don't really know anything about Anderson, but by delving into this, we're realizing, you know the more people don't know about something that makes a fun project because you can share some things. We even had family members coming up saying, I'd never seen that photo before, or right. I, I had not, I didn't know the, that that wheel belonged to George Orr. That you was know. a great little nugget. I didn't know they started yeah. Shearwater with George Orr's yeah. wheel. Really cool. Yeah. There were the museum. When we sh showed the first cut to them, they were, where'd you get that? Where'd you get that print? Where'd you do that? I mean, it was, they were even surprised. Uh -huh. Well, see, we filmed a lot of the artwork out on the island and things moving across. Obviously, we didn't take original Walter Andersons and stick them in the wet sand. <laughs> You know, but I'm filming across there, and we showed a brief clip to the museum. And Maddie, the curator, Maddie Codling, says, "When did you get those?" And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" She said, "When did you get those originals?" I'm like, "Maddie, those are prints." And I, I knew right then, if we fooled the curator of the Anderson collection, <laughs> we were on to something. So visually, the book and the film and Walter Anderson's art—you just can't go wrong with with telling his story. So we were just thankful that the family gave us the opportunity to do this, and hope people go check out the book. Did y'all go out to Horn Island? Yes, we. I, I stayed out there twice, and wow, what a! Um, I got eaten alive by mosquitoes the second time. I, I could only imagine. And I've been out to the Barrier Islands. Well, that, it, that trip in the in the film of sailing out there, I sailed with John and filmed. Well, someone had to shoot exactly. It. <laughs> and on the way back, the wind died, and we had to row for hours. And he was apologizing. I'm so sorry. I said, John. Nobody gets to do this. Your dad, this is how your dad did it. Right. Nobody gets to experience. I was sick for, I mean, sore for a month, you know, but nobody got, got to do that. And John so. talks about in one clip about the uh, Orlock sounds when yeah. he was under the pier and his dad is, is rowing in and how he was embarrassed. And it's away. powerful stuff. It's yeah. very powerful. It's a powerful uh, piece of work, guys. And, and good luck. Thank Lord you. knows it's, it, it's, um, it's a great creation that we're all looking forward to. We're proud of it. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. 
On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by...